You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land, a variable feast of movies, Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip, with Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rubin. Today, we talk to Roger Friedman, Showbiz 411, and now, here's Julian, Arthur, and Steve. Hey, guys. Roger, welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land. Thank you very much. So you you have a, an amazing reputation for finding a lot of interesting information about all aspects of show business. I'm curious where all this began. Were you inspired by someone as a child to be a show business fanatic? Well, um, I guess I was. I was, you know, raised in New York, in the New York area. Uh, our, when we were kids, our lives were on Broadway. We, My mother... Uh, for years was the was uh uh an office holder at the uh, outer critic circle on broadway she's a theater critic and uh for national public radio um so i ha- we had that and we had a, a lot of showbiz uh, in the, in our family history uh my dad who shares a name with you uh who's now passed away was not a, a showbiz person but he loved it but he was uh, an attorney a lawyer uh up here in connecticut and um, he had a lot of clients who were showbiz people, including the great Morris Karnofsky, uh, who was uh, a great Shakespearean actor who was blacklisted um, and and several others. So, you know, we had it we had it around us all the time. I spent some time with Morris and uh, got to know him well. He uh, was doing a play called Lamp at Midnight, which was about Galileo. Uh-huh. And uh, he, uh, the playwright, and he came to me and said, can you get him on some shows? And I, of course, was able to. He had an incredible voice. And I saw him play in Connecticut, Polonius. And yep. he was sensational. Yeah. Well, it, he, he and his wife, Phoebe Brand, were my parents' friends, a lot older than my parents, but they were uh, their great friends. And they lived in the next town, Easton, Connecticut. Oh, did you know you could write quickly as a young kid? I didn't know that. Uh, what happened was uh, I was just a journalist, and I had a monthly magazine called Fame Magazine in the 80s, which was sort of like Vanity Fair. And um, and from there, I went to New York Magazine, where I had a weekly column with the Intelligencer. Then I was lured to the Internet. Uh, by Fox News, which had just started their foxnews.com in 1998. And it wasn't a crazy company then. I mean, it was right wing, but it wasn't insane like it is now. And uh, Roger Ailes and I got along very well. And I was writing a daily column uh, for foxnews.com. And I did that for about 11, 10, 11 years. And um, somehow in 2009, Something happened. There was like literally, you could feel it. It was like a day when everything changed and it went from being uh, daily to hourly. And so I went from monthly to weekly to daily to hourly. Mm. And wow. At that point, you had to just be very confident about what you were doing. Um, and uh, and it, it actually worked out pretty well because when we were at New York Magazine, we would close the magazine on a Thursday. But if you had a big scoop, and in my case, I was covering the O.J. Simpson trial and things that were breaking, uh, we couldn't wait till Monday to put out the scoops. So we'd, we'd have to give them to page six right away with our credit, and they would pick them up and run them the next day. So we were like ahead of the magazine's publication for the readers. And it was frustrating because, you know, you wanted to get it out. You wanted to get it out. But there was no facility for doing that at the time. Um, so I, the Fox News, when I started Fox 411, uh, I kind of loved it because I thought, well, this is great. I'm producing a lot of news and it's coming out as soon as I'm producing it. I don't have to wait. Um, 
And then, uh, so man, that was just on a daily basis. And, and then it became, you know, this urgency of having news 24 hours a, a day. Roger, excuse me. Was there ever, was there ever a hotter story in, in news, gossipy news, whatever, you know, high, high, than, than the OJ thing? Was there ever anything bigger? You know, it was so crazy because I had just, I'd been at New York Magazine writing features and, uh, Kurt Anderson was the, uh, editor in chief. When and he came in and uh, one day and I used to I was on staff but I was working at home and uh, and mostly and I would come in and there was like a little corner of the room uh, where you heard a lot of noise all the time like people fighting and phones ringing and a, a lot of craziness and that was the intelligence or I didn't know that at the time and one day I came in and Kurt said to me oh listen. The guy who co co writes the intelligencer um, left at lunchtime. He just put a sign on his desk saying, "I'm gone," and just disappeared, and we've never heard from him again. Whoa! I can't, I, I can't remember his name anymore. There was a great woman there named Pat Wexler from Newsday, and she was right. She was writing it with him, and then Kurt said to me, "Oh, if you want to keep working here, you have to go do the intelligencer with Pat Wexler," and I said. Oh, those people look like they're working very hard. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, if you want to keep getting paid, that's what you're going to do. So I went to do the Intelligencer, and I was doing it like three or four months. And then I can I remember it was the day after my birthday. It was June 12th, uh, 1994. And um, I, as I came out of the shower that morning, the radio was on and I heard this story about OJ Simpson being arrested. And I said, Oh God, I wish that story were in New York. How will I ever do that? But as it turned out, I had a lot of contacts in LA and they started calling in almost immediately and it became my ballywick. And I actually spent months. I would go back and forth to the trot to the courtroom. Um, and I, I used to go with Dominic Dunn. We, I drive him down from the Chateau. We both stay at the Chateau and I drive him down to the courthouse. And we had a lot of fun together. He was amazing. Um, so he that's was, uh, he really was amazing, and, and wrote some wonderful books uh, about old books. time Hollywood. Oh wow! And a great yeah. storyteller. Did Did you get a chance to talk to OJ at all, Raj? No. Oh no, 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 no. And no by the time, I mean, I went to the preliminary hearings. Were in so he, the murders were in were July, June twelfth. The preliminary hearings were like the second week of uh, July. And from then on, he was like doped up in court because uh, they were nervous about him, you know, shouting things out. Uh, he was a mess. And we didn't. And I have a whole theory about that. But it it's all has to be t it ties in with all the reporting I did then. But he was like in um, steroid withdrawal. He was a heavy steroid user. Hmm. And he probably at that point, or right after the murders, he was. Uh, in jail. So, uh, he wasn't taking the steroids and he was having a very bad time. Um, so well, I, did... I just want to mention one thing fast, uh, Roger, uh, Steve Rubin and I, Arthur Friedman, we lived right there. We lived where the whole thing took place. Uh, Steve, were you up in, on Mallorca at the time? Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. That would have been, uh, well, what year was well, that? 94? You would remember whatever year it was. You'd remember the OJ. It was 94. That was the year we got married. We had just come back from our honeymoon. And I know, I'll never forget the slow speed chase down the 405. We were on our way to, to the movies, listening to it on the radio. And we were going to see the movie Speed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that 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 murder, that thing, that whole situation changed our neighborhood. We lived uh, on Barrington, and oh, you were on Barrington. just getting just getting to the supermarket became an event because all of the helicopters and. But this it lasted for weeks. It wasn't just a you know a, a two hour event. And and you know where I where I stay now. I'm very lucky that my friends have a guest house, but I stay in Kenter Canyon. So sure. when I when I come down onto San Vicente, I'm right in the in the heart of the whole OJ drama. Yes, and it's a it's it's very strange. And the house is gone on Rockingham. It was raised. Um, Didn't know that. But by yeah, the was, time I, I was finished with this thing, I knew every neighbor. I, I knew every single person in that on Rockingham and Bundy and all these people. And uh, 
for the first six months, uh, from that July, from the pretrials to December, we had a lot of time, uh, and there was no internet, so things weren't things didn't happen as quickly, news breaking wise. So it gave us a lot of time, gave me a lot of time to explore ways that OJ could be innocent. You know, who were all these people? Because it was a big uh, cast of characters that we didn't know. And um, it took time to figure out who everyone was. And, you know, it, it, it was a while before I got into meeting blood splatter specialists and things like that. But we would call, we would call the OJ a story. If you had a list, 10 top stories like that, that, were, that just captured the entire public, uh, that would be, if not number one, certainly within the top several. Uh, it was also at a time, it was also, if you remember, it was a time of court TV was getting started and there were things like Menendez. And then I had Michael Jackson was a bit, was my big thing at Fox News. There used to be a lot of great trials. I always say now what we need is a good murder. Uh, if just one celebrity could murder another one, we could really be in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't seem interested anymore. Um, I was I was at a company dinner. I was working for Scotty Brothers uh, Pictures at the time. This is in 1989. And uh, we had a company dinner with uh, live entertainment, uh, Jose Menendez's company. I sat across the table from Jose Menendez talking about World War II movies, because as you recall, guys, I wrote a book called Combat Films, which I ended up giving to Jose. He sent me some uh, some of his, uh, I think they were VHS cassettes in those days. And the next week, we released Eddie and the Cruisers Part 2, which was a complete fiasco. Tony <laughs> Scotty lost millions. It was a terrible thing. And I, we came in on Monday morning, and everybody had long faces. I said, come on, it's just a movie. And even though we've lost a fortune, it's not that bad. And they weren't upset about that. They said that Jose and Kitty Menendez were found dead last night. And we were really in shock because our companies were very close to one another. So and now the now the Menendez are back in the news. They're trying to get off because they have this uh, new information. Uh, what's the story on that, Roger? You know, I don't know too much about it. And actually, the way I, the way I came, I wasn't paying attention to it. And then a few months ago, Rosie O'Donnell, who also has a podcast, had uh, Lyle Menendez on uh, her show. And so she and I talked about it before he came on. And I guess that there's uh, a lot of other evidence that proves that Jose Menendez uh, was an abuser uh, uh, in a very, well, obviously in a bad way. So um, maybe they have proof that they were telling the truth all along. Um, I, I, just, wonder how, I, I wonder I just how don't he know. Could, I wonder how he could broadcast. Isn't he still in jail or not? Oh, no, she uh, he's in jail. She went there and got permission to interview him. Oh. And uh, and it was very, it was really interesting. And now, of course, they're uh, making, uh, there was a TV movie, but now they're making, um, a, uh, I think it's Ryan Murphy is doing um, a Netflix miniseries uh, that's going to really expand the whole thing and include all this information. And so we'll see what happens. The industry you are in is as sustainable as anything I've ever seen. There's always <laughs> something, there's always been something, and there's always going to be something. Oh, yeah. The, the weird thing is, um, you know, I plan a lot of stories in advance, as Julian knows. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be working on things that are just of interest to me or pop up or things that are coming. But then the daily things that happen, which you have to respond to within seconds. And there's always two or three things happening every day. You can't, you, you know, I wake up and I think, oh, there'll be nothing today. And then by 11 o'clock, you know, you're knee deep in three or four stories. Roger, what is your morning regimen like when you get out of bed? What were where are you first uh, learning about stuff? You know, on my phone, which is different also. Uh, but, you know, you're learning. I, I love Twitter. I, I know everyone has a problem with Elon Musk. So do I. But I, I Twitter is a great uh, marketing tool and it's a great deliverer of information. And if something's happening something it's happening on it, it, i'll know on twitter within seconds sometimes the worst part is and i get blamed for this a lot here is that i'll wake up in the middle of the night and turn on the phone and then you suddenly see something that's happening at four in the morning 
And I have to say to myself, can I do it? And I get up out of bed and write the story. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's something coming from London, you know, four in the morning, it's nine, it's uh, nine in the morning there. Uh, the worst thing for me is when I'm in Los Angeles, because then I'm three hours behind the real world. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't stand it. So I, I'm up at six o'clock in the morning because or earlier sometimes, sometimes I don't go to sleep until everything is done. Like on an award show night, if I'm out there for the Oscars or the Grammys or something like that, I, I, I can't go to sleep until I've finished writing the column. Hey, what would you say, Roger, are some of the scoops that you've had over the years, the ones that you might be proud of or the ones that you are kind of known for, would you say? Well, I will tell you about the Chris Rock slap but to start with. So usually I have seats in the Oscars in the Dolby Theater. But that two years ago, 2022, I was in the press room. And the press room, is a, it's a big room. And I was on the right side, let's say, the left side was all international journalists. And what happens is, and there's screens up, and you put earpieces in to listen to what's going on in the main room. What happens is when people win, the winners come into the room, and then they do like a little press conference. So the, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was the Dune uh, cinematographer won the one, and he, they came in, and the people on the left side of the room were absolutely fascinated by him. And they were asking questions. They were very involved. And I didn't really care. And I didn't know who he was. And I was listening and looking up at the screen because I saw they said, Chris Rock is coming. So I said, oh, I love Chris Rock. I want to see what he's, he'll be funny. So um, I'm listening and my laptop was open just like this and live. And I see Will Smith hit him. So I write into the computer. I say, Oh, Will Smith just hit Chris Rock. And as I'm writing the story live into my server, the, the uh, uh, it absolutely everything starts to go crazy. And uh I was knocked off the server because I had such a spike in traffic, literally like in 10 mm-hmm. seconds or less, that it was so much that uh but luckily I had written the initial story very fast into the computer. So the people on the other side are now coming to me going, is this a joke? It was like in slow motion. And they're going, is this a joke? And I'm like, I don't think it's a joke because he just told him to go fuck himself, you know, on national TV. And everybody, everybody watching that thought it was a joke at first. Right. I'm <laughs> like, it's not a joke. And they're like, oh, my God. And then the I had messaged the server people, and they it was like Scotty on Star Trek. I said, throw, throw out everything that's inhibiting us from being on the air because I've got to get back the, onto the Internet. And I don't know what they did, but they, you know, threw out whatever was blocking us. And I got back on. So that, that was like an amazing thing. And everybody was following me in the room and asking me questions. So that was actually a very, that was like a fun thing for us. And then it stalled for a while because people in the in the big room didn't. And then I walked into the big room. People in the big room didn't know what to do. And they were trying to figure out during the commercial, do we say something? Do we come back? Do we chastise him? Do we just ignore this? You know? And so it was, that was the, the the best time to ever be in the press room and to have access to, uh, you know, the computer instantly when things were happening. Yeah. Did, Chris, did Chris Rock walk into the press room after he left the stage? No, nobody came in. No, nobody came in. no, we were, we were, and we were hoping that Will Smith, you know, win best actor and come on in. And they're like, that's not happening. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's in the news these days that the Paramount Global, as they now call it, <laughs> may, be, may be up for sale or is up for sale. Have you gotten involved in this story at all? You know, a little bit, only in the sense that, like everybody has in the business, that we're thinking uh, it looks like Warner Brothers, David Zaslav wants them. Although then today I was reading a, a thing about Z- David Zaslav saying, well, in another week or so, he's going to be legally free to start selling off parts of Warner Brothers Discovery. So is he selling off parts? Is he buying parts? Um, I had a talk with Zaslav at the American Film Institute luncheon in January, and uh, it was off the record. But basic, but overall, he was um, seemed very committed to not selling anything off and to uh, expanding. So I, I I think there's a there's a he'll be in the game and then Comcast Universal NBC they would they're interested in 
in uh, Paramount. Um, will uh, the government will the government uh, allow this? You think? I think so because uh, you look at Fox and Disney did the same thing. So and that finally went through. And, uh, you know, they'll say you have to sell off some TV stations, you know, the, yeah. uh, you know, the trading back and forth. But um, well, we should point out, if we may, that Paramount is not just the, what I grew up with Paramount Pictures. It's CBS Network. It's Nickelodeon. It's uh, Comedy Central. It's BET, the BET Network, MTV, VH1. It's a very, very large company. And um, what it's also, also Simon think- Schuster. Because Simon and Schuster, they tried to sell to Random House, to a company now known as Random House Doubleday Penguin, which yeah. when I was in book publishing, the idea that all these people would be in one company is crazy. Yeah. But um, so they, they've never not been able to sell Simon and Schuster. So that will come with the package, too. Yes, by by the right. way, Julian, you left out the biggest, the biggest uh, piece of the pie, Paramount Plus, their streaming channel, which right. seems to get all the publicity these days. Don't forget also Showtime, where I worked for ten years. Showtime is slowly disappearing into the into the into the uh, ether. And then uh, there was some talk uh, in the last few days of Paramount Plus and Peacock um, joining forces. So that would mean that actually uh, NBC, which owns Peacock, uh, that they may be uh, interested in doing something with paramount if they're if they're uh, trying to merge their streaming services and with everybody thinking out there that uh, the linear linear television business is on the, on the way down byron allen who came from god knows look at this and he's looking he thinks linear tv is the place to go so yeah and, he, and he's been one of the people that paramount have supposedly been talking to uh right he did try to get bet he did try to get VH1 at one point. Yes. So, yeah. Julian, he offered Paramount $14 billion cash deal. Wow. Yeah. I think, I think the linear networks, the strong suit of them is still the sports. Nobody yes. can equal the, the numbers they get in the sports world, as opposed to their TV shows, which, you know, barely have a pulse with a very few exceptions. It's but, a big change, Roger, and you've seen it. You've been around long enough to see it. Can you take us through, let's say, I don't know, I don't think you were really uh, close to Hedda Hopper, but we, we, <laughs> but we can nope. talk, we can, we can talk about that and how it evolved if you if you feel comfortable. Well, but I was raised by Liz Smith, who was the Hedda Hopper of her day. Yes. So and uh, and Cindy Adams to some extent. So um, yeah, I, I know what that's all like, and of course. You know, right before Liz left us, she said to me, honey, this is over. The whole thing is over. <laughs> uh, she actually, the last, in 2016, was what, I think when she passed away, and it was just as Trump was running, and she said, you know, pol- politics is the new entertainment. So people are going to be fascinated. Only, by only part of it. Only part of it. It expanded it. That's all. Yeah. Well, Trump it's, is his own ongoing miniseries that won't end. It's never she, end. It's going to end soon. But, um, you know, this. you go back to Walter Winchell, you go back to Earl Wilson in New York, and uh, as I say, there's an insatiable appetite that the public has for gossip or these kind of stories. Uh, and politics has, in fact, laid a whole different layer on it. Uh, Ted Kennedy going back with, with whatever was going on. Uh, it, it's just it's endless. So you've got a, a, a bank of things to, to always refer to. Yeah, and this summer when uh, the strikes were on and I was really uh, searching for stories, I registered with uh, Trump's social media, the Truth Social, and uh, I guess it was back in May. Um, and I don't think other people were going on there really because he's so, you know, awful. But um, I thought, well, this will be interesting. I can keep track of him there. And then he started to publish these crazy things that were so insane. And all I did was, sort of reiterate them and write about what he was doing. And I got a huge amount of traffic for months. So people, it's like people being, it's like rubbernecking, you know, you're coming down the Merritt Parkway and you can't think, why is everyone stopped? Well, they're stopped because they're looking at the silly accident that's happened. And he knows that. And and they, they, he knows that. And they all know that's what they do. The outrageous statements that come from, from these people, they know it's going to get attention. 
You know, exactly. you know, back in the day, in the 30s and 40s, the so-called golden age of Hollywood, the studio PR departments had these guys who basically were in charge of making sure nobody found out what the celebrities were doing. They were kept under a, a cone of silence and some very egregious stuff was av- av- was happening. Today, virtually every human being on the planet now has a camera phone with video access. I'm curious how the uh, proliferation of all this electronic media in civilian hands has made your job easier, Roger. Well, it's made it easier and it's made it harder. Um, the On the easier side, um, uh, I guess what's happening is the, the celebrities themselves are posting their own information without publicists interfering. So this is very strange, right? Because now you have Instagram, you have Facebook, and suddenly all the uh, all the columnists, so to speak, like Page Six or whatever it is, are referring to these Instagram posts. So and so says on Instagram today that they're bisexual. So and so says today on Instagram that they killed four people last week, and you know that kind of thing. So you you have to monitor like 500 different kinds of social media sites to see what people are up to. And uh, so that's a big change. Uh, And the person who grabs it first sort of gets the so-called exclusive. There's another site. Well, there's another, there's a a entertainment website that takes things off of there and makes them their, their exclusives when it's not anyone's exclusive. It's just happened that it was posted. Are you talking about TMZ? No, well, no, TMZ is a whole other thing. No, deadline.com. Deadline. No, TMZ, that's, you know, they're ambulance chasers. You know, they have people paid in every uh, hospital, uh, every fire department. Police stations. Police stations, mortuaries. uh, (laughs) You know, they have people stationed outside restaurants all day and night. So they're constantly, you know, uh, garnering this information and mostly paying for it. and then the other side of it is um, it's it, it, it's bad that the celebrities do this because now there's it doesn't give you as much opportunity for reporting. You have to just go with what they're saying, and it's available to everyone simultaneously. So it's harder to get some exclusives and some scoops because people are com- constantly the celebrities are constantly vomiting up information that you're right. The <laughs> old publicists the old publicists would stop them from saying. Yes. You, know, you read stuff and you say, oh, I don't care what your sexual orientation is, or I don't I don't care about this or that. But they're going to tell you any. It's like too much information, you know? Yes. When did Showbiz 411 start? Was it 2009, that early? Well, I was fired by Fox News on April 1st, 2009. That's a long story. And then immediately, uh, the Hollywood Reporter called me. And they said, oh, we'll hire. And I, I said, well, well, that's actually not what happened. But there was very quickly, like the next day, uh, GoDaddy called. And they said, oh, we love your column and we'll, we'll make you a website. So they, I didn't even really know what that was at that time. So they, they made me the website and they, and they bought the name for me as a gift, uh, which was hilarious because I didn't really understand what was going on. And I was, uh, going to, I was at an opening night of a Broadway show, and uh, this great woman who was running GoDaddy kept calling me during the show saying, I've got the name Showbiz411 down to like $30,000 or something. And I'd say, oh, I have no money. And then she'd call back later and say, I've got them down to $800. <laughs> <laughs> I still have no money. The and then, story. Uh, finally, at the, I can't remember what show it was. I could look it up. And at the just as the uh, show ended, and I turned the phone back on, and she said, "Oh, we're just going to give it to you for free. We can't, we can't deal with this." <laughs> so, and then she had a guy design it for me, and we went up. And like two weeks later, the Hollywood Reporter uh, people called, and they said, "Oh, we would license this from you and put this on our site through uh, Nielsen, which was the company that owned them at the time." So I said, "Oh, wow, okay, let's do that." So we did it. And I did that for about a year. And then, if you remember, The Hollywood Reporter and Billboard were owned by uh, Guggenheim Partners and uh, Jimmy Finkelstein. And uh, they bought it out from Nielsen. Um, And then they immediately uh, decided to clear the decks. 
So they said to me, oh, you know, we're going to let you go. And I said, well, I have a contract. I just signed with your company for a year. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then while that was going on, and it was sort of like a lot of upheaval, um, another somebody I knew, which was just lucky, who works for uh, Eric, who worked for Eric Schmidt from Google. And it turned out Eric Schmidt had this uh, venture capital company. And um, they called me up and they said, oh, if you want to leave this deal you've got with The Hollywood Reporter, uh, we'll finance like a business for you. So I said, and they flew me to Aspen. I was like so impressed. I had been, I was at the Oscars and they said, we'll pick you up in L.A. and fly you to Aspen for these big meetings and then send you home. And I was like, OK. And this was at the height of when there was money and people were just throwing it around. So I, you know, I'd never been to Aspen. So I said, why not? And, uh, and so we did that for two years. I was, uh, my great investor and I was really grateful for him was Eric Schmidt. And then finally, after a couple of years, he said, you know, this, you could just take this and make it your own company. So he sort of launched me on my own. So that's, so about, uh, 2012, that's when I sort of went out as my own company. So that's, oh, so you've been, well, you're celebrating your 12th year then. I guess so. I haven't, yeah. yeah. And the beginning was very, the, the, that 2012 to 2014 was just a big learning period. Um, but, uh, but I was lucky because my traffic took off and people followed me from Fox News. So are you, are you going out all over the world, Roger? Is your stuff out there? Everything's the internet is all over the world. Everything is all over the world. Unless they're they're blocking me in China, you know, I don't know. (laughs) No. You know, in the in the in the nineties, nineteen nineties, my wife and I managed Sandra D. Now that's the nineties, a little uh, bit beyond. I can't tell you how many times we were confronted with magazines and and if she got to she had to go to a hospital in the middle of the night, there were in fact people there and the stories got out. But it's uh, it's you, you couldn't we couldn't get away from it. Um, you can't get away from it now. Yeah, and a lot of things. I, I always think of it as like Lucy's candy. Uh, you know, yeah, keeps coming. <laughs> yeah, so, as uh, the conveyor belt, because stories will go by where I look at it and I go, I'm not getting involved with this. It's right. already passed. Right. You know, yeah. I can't. I can't get a hook into this, and I'm. I just, or I'll come back later when everyone has collapsed from reporting about it. But there's like a con- and so much. Uh, fake news and fake stuff. The uh, uh, Google uh, and anything you, uh, any websites you go to on the on the internet are filled with these news aggregators. They're called, and I want, I want to go like this: news aggregators. And they're not aggregating news; they're aggregating like crap that's sort of National Enquirer, um, that kind of thing, and it's just garbage to fill up sites. So none of it is true. And so you're constantly fighting the battle of saying this isn't really happening. Like everyone will rush to the side to say, oh, look what's going on. You go, it's not really happening. So come back, sit down. And this is what's really going on. Meantime, those rags keep selling. Uh, so many public, so many magazines have closed, but the Globe and, and Inquirer and that they keep selling it at counters and supermarkets. And also that they're feeding these, what they've learned is that they can feed the internet with this garbage right. and it pumps up uh, clickbait so that people are clicking on it on the internet and then sort of reading three quarters in and realizing there's absolutely no point to the story they're reading. But the headline took them in. Yeah. Which leads kind of following up on what Arthur said, what is the future of print? I mean, you guys, obviously New York has the New York Times, which is kind of like the the ultimate newspaper, uh, the Wall Street Journal's back east. Uh, our, our L.A. Times in L.A. is dying on the vine. I don't know if it's going to survive. Uh, Roger, what do you, do you, I mean, amongst young people, the under 40s, is anybody reading anymore? What's your feeling? They're not reading anything. My nieces are 24. They're going to be 24 next month. And they're twins. Uh, they're fr- they and their friends don't read anything. They get everything off of social media. They learn everything from TikTok and from Instagram. Um, they don't care about the New York Times. Um, I, I don't think very much like that penetrates them. So it's all for people over at least over 40. Scary. Um, and the New York Post is only in business because of Rupert Murdoch. And the minute he dies, they're going to wind that thing up because it loses so much money. 
and it's just his pet project. But I can't imagine uh, that the company will keep allowing that. That would be an interesting thing from Alexander Hamilton to Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. That's a duel. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> I happened to see a, uh, a, a half hour or so, whatever it was, that Jake Tapper on CNN just did with uh, s- uh, scandals, United States scandals, I mean, having to do uh-huh. with Rob Blagojevich. Oh, my goodness. He's not gone? He's still around? He's still around, out of prison because he was pardoned. But uh, they have that. Next one they're going to do, I think, is on either John Edwards or one of the other senators who had a scandal. That whole thing, just political scandals, could, could take it through 52 weeks. But no one's watching CNN. Yeah. Well, that's why they're trying to do this. It doesn't matter. Nothing will change. They're, they're in a stuck position. Uh, the best they do on uh, during the prime time uh, during the week is 700,000 viewers, where uh, Sean Hannity and Rachel Maddow are doing like 2.3 or 2.4 million against them. So really, I don't, I don't really understand. I mean, I like to watch CNN, and I'm sure because people of our age, I think, in an emergency, you turn to CNN. But uh, for re- the regular daily uh, discourse, um, you're either on Fox News getting you know their warped version of the world, or you're getting uh, MSNBC trying to counter it. Does Do anyone you- care that the Fox News stuff has been proven to just be so many lies one after another, and they feed the beast all the time? Is it people keep coming back? They keep coming back. Okay, you know I see like very occasionally you'll see someone on on Fox News say live, "Oh, that isn't true." And the other person sitting next to them will go, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> um, but and strangely enough, there's, uh, sometimes it's from Steve Ducey, who I think is a, sort of an idiot. Um, but he sometimes he'll say during Fox, I call it Fox and Fiends, during Fox and Friends, <laughs> he'll turn to somebody else on the panel and say, uh, that isn't true at all. And then they go to a commercial and then they reprogram him or something. Yeah. And, he comes back and he's like, okay, back to whatever. But no, they don't, the audience seems to love whatever it is. That, they don't care. It's feeding into their fears and their um, worries about their lives and that somehow minorities are taking things away from them and immigrants are taking things away from them. And if only they were all gone, their lives would improve so much. And that's, it's the, it's that it should be called fear factor, really. Yeah. Uh, but that they love it. Is there They're a way out for CNN? What does CNN have to do to come? I don't back? know. I, I you know um, I talk about this with a friend friend in media all the time. We we keep saying they started this show with Gail King and um, uh, Charles Barkley. Barkley called King Charles that absolutely nobody is watching, not even uh, mental patients, and uh, <laughs> pets, pets are turning it off. Um, what they really need to do is is do a show at nine o'clock the way they had Larry King and just forget about the politics at nine o'clock and have on like the hot person of the day. But we thought Howard Stern would be a great host for that. Um, but do something like that where it's like immediate and it's live. And if something happened during the day, that person is on that night on that show. Other than I don't know. How important is theater to your West Coast folks? Do they call you a lot to find out stuff about the theater or they just don't care? The L.A. people, what do you think, Julian? I think they don't care. Do L.A. people care about it? I don't think they do. What's theater? (laughs) No, they've shut down part of uh, Mark Taper Forum, right? Well, that said, guys, I, I, I went to the theater last night. I saw a live performance of The Wiz at the Pantages. How is it? And it was wonderful. I, I, it's not a great play or a great musical. The songs aren't that memorable, but the performances, the dancing, the singing were just terrific. And uh, I, I, I am an L.A. person. I'm not a theater person. I'm always talking to Arthur and, and uh, Julian about the fact that I know I'm like Schultz in, uh, on Hogan's Heroes. I know nothing. I know <laughs> nothing about theater. And uh, it's very different out here. We're very, well, I don't even know if we're film-centric anymore because the film business is in such a toilet right now. 
you know, in terms of talk about a one dimensional business. I'm not interested in seeing Iron Man six, but there's a lot of young people who are paying money to see it. It just doesn't compute. Yeah. Well, the theater, um, I have uh, a woman in L.A. who go who covers uh, theater for me as much as she can. And uh, but she'll call, I'll say, oh, you're going to the opening. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people there. There's no one there. There's like one celebrity in the audience. Nobody seems to care. Um, it, it must be very hard because I think the people who work on the shows at, Dar at Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and that whole group, Center Theater East or whatever, Center Theater, um, I, I know that they're artists and they want an audience. But I think it's very hard to get people to come downtown to see the shows. It's not like New York where or London, where it's part of the, the, the daily breathing. Yet, Roger, the, the road shows in Midwest and Toronto and so many different places around the United States and Canada do very well. Julian will talk about that. Yeah. Make their money that way. That way. Well, that, you know, L.A. is like a road show. I mean, basically, when The Wiz comes to the Pantages, last night it was packed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I often think that we're like Des Moines in some ways. We get the road show performances. We don't just even though we have a lot of little theater, we don't really generate big Broadway type shows here. No, I think The Wiz is coming to New York, though. I think that that production is coming here next. I, I think I think you'll enjoy it very much because the actors are just wonderful. I saw oh, the original it, cast was nineteen uh, seventies thereabout, maybe in the early eighties. I'm not sure, but it was one of the greatest shows I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great Roger, show, Roger. You wrote recently about uh, Sam Mendes and the Beatles. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well. I don't know how that's going to work out. Sam Mendes is great. He's an Oscar winner, a Tony winner. Uh, he may be an Emmy winner for all I know. Um, you know, I loved 1917. I thought it was such a great movie. And he's uh, he's capable of doing anything well. So uh, he's signed on to make four Beatles movies. And I guess it'll be sort of a Rashomon kind of thing about how they got together. But it doesn't seem like that would really be feasible in the long run, unless it were sort of some kind of mini series that was chopped together or something. I'm not, it's not a little unclear how they're going to do this, like to have Paul's movie and the John's movie. I don't know that they would take up a whole movie, at, you know, in their young lives, but that's the idea. And then Sony, uh, I was laughing because deadline was like, Oh, Sony got this and nobody else did. And they're such geniuses, but Sony pictures is part of, you know, Japanese Sony, which also owns uh, Sony Music Publishing, which has the, Be the rights to the Beatles music. So they're still corporate cousins, and that's how the deal was made. Well, the intent is to make four separate movies uh, right. on, on them and to uh, get their point of view uh, and, hey, they're still, they're still box office. So uh, Well, together they are, but I don't know um, – that separately, especially during the Beatles era, just if you just confined yourself to the like 10 years, let's say. Yes. From 60 to 70 or something like that, that um, that they would sustain four movies. I'm not sure that Ringo would sustain an entire movie, even though I love him. He's an incredible drummer. Um, but I don't know that his personal story would be compelling enough. To, uh, you might you might be right, but I, I have a feeling that uh, that the marketing machine that is Sony might just find its way through, and depends upon my, the other pictures that come out before that. Tom Rothman's got a pretty good nose. Uh, I wouldn't bet against him. Well, I hope you're right. Yeah, but you know there have been Beatle kind of movies before. Uh, there was Across the Universe, which was a Sony movie. Uh, there was Nowhere Boy, which uh, I think Harvey Weinstein released. There have been like Beatles stories and they've never been blockbusters. So, uh, so we'll see. You know, I think if it were Paul McCartney's story, that might do it. Or if it was the total Beatles story, uh, it could be a three hour movie, you know, which now is the, the, the average. Roger, you mentioned he who we usually don't like to name because he's been somewhat talk, some, not even somewhat totally toxic, Harvey Weinstein. Obviously, this whole story blew up a few years ago. Uh, were you aware uh, in your circles of a lot of his wrongdoing? No, no. I think everyone will tell you uh, 
no one had any idea that rape or violence was involved. Everyone thought that there was like a, a natural transaction going on where girls would show up looking for parts and were willing to do, as in the old days, uh, whatever they had to do on the casting couch and that it was consensual, they were agreeable to it and that there was a trade-off. You know, I saw him with young women all the time and that's what I assumed. I mean, the people closest to him thought that. No one thought that the minute the door closed, he was attacking them. So uh, I think that was a shock to everyone. Yeah, it was out there, but it was hidden. And it, But there were people obviously who did know and just didn't get involved, didn't talk about it. But like I say, I don't think even the assistants, you know, who would bring girls to the hotel rooms or that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think that they had in mind that something violent was going to happen. Um, and some, and, and this, I'm not making a distinction here. Uh, some women said to me, Oh, you know, he, he tried that with me and I managed to get out of it or mm. whatever. But the ones who were, who were surprised, who were definitely, you know, taken advantage of. But and look what it, the Me Too movement again did for your industry. It's a, another explosion. Well, not a good explosion. No, but nonetheless, it's it sells and it's out there. Yeah, I don't. I I. Uh, there's some people who've made a business out of it. Right. A couple of reporters who've really, uh, who've really made that their beat. I, I don't. I try not to get into that. That's, yeah. I leave it to others who know better about it. Roger, I've always been a huge Woody Allen fan. Uh, his movies are some of the just just the most fun I've had at the cinema, and yet he's become a bit of a pariah in some circles. What's your take on, on Woody and and his life uh, legacy? What do you think people will remember? Will they remember the dark stuff, or do they think the other stuff will shine through? You know, I love Woody, and I've defended him for years. Um, and I really... Um, uh, I really uh, feel bad for him because... I know that uh, the things he's accused of didn't happen. Um, also, he didn't, you know, marry his daughter or stepdaughter. He, you know, she, and they've been together. He and Sunni have been together for, you know, 30 years now. So obviously it was meant to be. They have two children who are really great. And um, so it was meant to be. I think Mia Farrow was rightfully upset when it happened and just made it her business to carry on like a lifelong vendetta. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, when the time comes and what he has to be remembered, that it, it, I'm sure his, I'm sure this Ronan Farrow hates him and he's been poisoned by his mother and so is his sister and they will carry on endlessly with revelations and all kinds of things that can't be defended but um, but uh, the movies are so great, and if you if you go back and look at almost all of them, there's 50 movies, and there may be five or six clunkers. That's very weird. I mean, that's a high success rate. First there's of one all, that I can't having, watch at all. First of all, having 50 movies in today's world is unheard yeah. of. Even the studio people, many of them, never had 50 movies. It's no. an extraordinary output of incredible film and Picasso who certainly was not what you'd call a guy you wanted to be in a foxhole with was is still his art li lives I believe Woody Allen's film will live as long as we're breathing on the planet and you know there were times putting aside the Mia Farrow stuff you know in the 50 movies you would say and I uh, you would say oh this one's a big one this one's more of a, this one's like, a, I would say this one's like a novel, like Hannah and her sisters. Then you get like a small one, like a short story, you know, like Radio Days and, or Zelig, you know. So you'd say there's the big ones and the the important, the big important ones. And then the ones where he just felt like he had to make, a, he wanted to make a movie. He had a fun story in mind. And uh, so when we got to Midnight in Paris or Vicky Cristina Barcelona, these are, or Blue Jasmine. Then we were like, these are the big, these are the big ones, and it's too bad because um, uh, Rainy Day in New York is a terrific movie that, of course, very few people have probably seen because it's just been on streaming 
and it was never released here uh, because uh, and when the Me Too thing happened uh, with Harvey and everything was coming apart and they were bringing up Woody's you know, past and trying to pin all this stuff on him, he had a movie out called Wonder Wheel that was really good and it, it got killed and that was the beginning of, of the end of him being picked up by you know legitimate distributors. So now I think they have um, Julian, what's the new one called? It's it's in French. It's oh, uh, Coupe de Chance. Yeah. Right. Coupe de Chance, which I, I saw over a, a year ago and reviewed and it's wonderful. It's a, it's really true. Have you seen it, Julian? I haven't. No, but I'm going to. I'm just a little bit behind. <laughs> but, and it's I, be a, but I'm so glad, Roger, that you feel the same way that I think all of us do. And, yeah. Um, I, again, I think the art will triumph no matter what on his legacy. Somewhere along the line, somewhat late in the game for it, for his movie making, he does a little movie called uh, Midnight in Paris. Right. Which is the biggest thing he's ever done. Yeah. And Great I was I, ha- I was lucky enough to be in Cannes. Uh, where it opened, and we were just our jaws dropped. Yes, about how great it was. Yeah, and um, and, and Blue Jasmine, you know, turned out to be fabulous. Oh, wow. and what a performance that woman gave! Oh my yeah. God, just Blanchett. Tell us a little bit about uh, Cannes and how it's changed in the years you've gone there. Well, I will say I know everyone hates Harvey, but when Harvey was there, Cannes was alive, and not with you know, violent things. It was party after party. It was screening after screening. He had the part about Harvey that people don't get now is that he had an incredible enthusiasm for the movies and for the business. So, I mean, we had no idea what was going on on the other side. So when you got to Cannes with him for like 20 years, it was, you know, the constant uh, excitement you know, when the artist, I remember when I, we were there and he said to me, oh, I've got this movie. It's in black and white and it's silent. And I said, what? what? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And he invited over a bunch, like a dozen people to his little screening room. And he goes, I'm going to present this like in two nights to a, in the, one of the big theaters. And we were like, gee, I don't know about this. And then we watched it and we said, well, this is like genius. This is a masterpiece. And, you know, he would create that energy around a movie so that we were writing about it two days before the actual screening. And then the actual screening happened and everybody went crazy. And so that was, to me, that was the fun of Ken. Now I went back last year for the first time since 2020. And uh, I went back for the Scorsese movie for killers of the flower moon, because I, I love Scorsese and I went to the opening night and it was wonderful. And you could see it was also a work of genius. But the rest of the time that I spent there was not that much fun. And after about a week, I said, I went to visit a friend who lives in Provence. And um, it just didn't have the same uh, craziness to it and the same fun. And this year, I'm not going to go. I might go back next year. Roger, uh, you know that Julian and I go back uh, many years. Uh, uh And it turns out that I... Years ago, in the 70s, when Harvey had a theater in Buffalo, uh, my company was the film buyer. We bought films for his, concert films, to fill in between whoever he brought in. So he calls me one day in the late 70s, I think it was, and he said, "My uh, Bobby and I are going going to Cannes, and uh, can you turn us on to anybody who can help us? Anybody. Uh I said, well, a good buddy of mine is Julian Schlossberg, and he's there. And that was Harvey and Julia. <laughs> so a small world story, but that's Julian Schlossberg is a legend, my friend. He is a legend. Absolutely. He's a, to me, he's a legend. Yes. Well, thank you very much. How'd you guys get to know each other? How'd Julian and you get to know each other? I think well, I saw you. I think I sought you out. You, you did. But, and I was very happy to be sought. <laughs> <laughs> also, he works with one of the great geniuses of all time, Elaine May. Yes. yes. You know, who I just have endless respect for and, and, and I'm constantly entertained and, and just love her. So, yeah. Ro- Roger, um, everybody has their favorite celebrity story. The person who most impressed you, who stood out uh, like no one else. Uh, if you were going to do another interview, you'd probably pick that person. Is there somebody that comes to mind that has been one of your favorite celebrities of all time? Obviously, you love Woody, but other than Woody, who would you pick? Well, I love Scorsese, 
I, I, I just think he's the Orson Welles of our generation and of our time. I, I, he's just so great to talk to. And, you know, I love his movies. People say, oh, Irishman is too long. I said, did you have something else to do tonight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. I want to see every beat played, you uh, know, but you might as well include everything. So I, I love him. Um, Robert Altman was my great friend, and I was so lucky to know him. And I miss him, you know, just every day. Um, Non-movie people, like uh, somebody like Kurt Vonnegut, who I was lucky to know. Um, he he was amazing. I love musicians. I'm a, I'm a music guy. And uh, so uh, Sting is incredible, great person to talk to, so smart, uh, so well-educated. Um, Carly Simon has been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, Clive Davis. Uh, who's now almost 92 is, uh, continues to be, he fills up my social card. He has a party or an event almost, it feels like every week. A genius. <laughs> so, yeah. And right. a genius. He was a genius. And a genius. What is currently in your computer at the moment? When's the next burst of Friedman coming on and what is it? Uh, probably after we, uh, shut down. I don't know. I have a couple of things in mind that I'm working on. And I have to see what's happened during the hour we've been on this. Um, but uh, I just did a story, like the little things will catch your attention, like Beyonce is having a moment with country music. So uh, that's, it's a very, very unusual uh, move that she's made. It was absolutely the right thing to do. So that's been a lot of fun to write about. Um, and just last night in the music and TV, uh, yesterday on the Today Show, Savannah Guthrie had this, singer country singer on who i guess country fans know and she sang a song that i've never heard of before and the song and the album were from 2016 and they went straight to number one last night mm -hmm. whoa that really sets you back you say oh wow people are watching the today show so uh so that was a fun story you know that kind of thing it's fabulous that's fabulous i I, I have to say that I grew up on Army Archard and uh, Hank Grant. Uh, the two when we had daily trades in LA. Yeah, and, uh, it was long, long before the internet. Um, I knew Army very well, and uh, I, I think of him when I'm writing. All the I think of him and Liz Smith when I'm writing all the time, especially Liz. But Army was great, and he had look. The reason he had longevity it was he knew how to do it. Without making enemies, I always love. I always love uh, Army's. Uh, they ha had a big dinner for him at the uh, Beverly Hilton, and Red Button spoke, of course, as the closing. Never had a dinner. Army's getting a dinner, and he, he had a line with Army. He said, "Army Archer, a man who who taught Sylvester Stallone to read Daily Variety without moving his lips." <laughs> Red Button, that was great. <laughs> Well, Roger, I know we're very grateful for you. I'm really glad you came. Oh, I'm so honored to be with you guys. And do it we again. We can do this one again for sure, Julian. Yeah. Ro Roger, tell the folks who are listening how to reach your various uh, outlets and where they can find your work. Well, showbiz411.com with our new design that started last night. <laughs> and that's our main place. And then we're on Twitter at showbiz411. And uh, occasionally on Instagram at Showbiz Four One One, and that's and Facebook sometimes too. I'm glad they bought it for you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I have to tell you, uh, they were really nice people, and they were fans. That was so funny. I, I you know, you have no idea who's reading you, and um, and it turned out this guy Bob Parsons and this woman Christine, who was, they were running uh, GoDaddy, and they called up and they said, "We read you every day. We well, don't want to lose that." So I'm very grateful to them. I'll read you, Roger. To our listeners, thank you for listening today. We always like hearing from you. As you know, we're on all the podcast platforms. Tales from Hollywood Land uh, is our name. You can reach us at talesfromhollywoodland at gmail.com. We now have a YouTube channel. Just Google, uh, Google YouTube and Tales from Hollywood Land. We love hearing from you if you'd like to write to us. Like I said, uh, write to Tales from Hollywoodland at Gmail. We always look for interesting uh, topics and guests. So that's how we keep in touch with our fans. And thank you. Thank you again, Roger. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.
It's a new era for Doctor Who. Life depends on change and renewal. And the crew from Earth Station Who podcast will continue to guide you through the past, present, and future of the franchise. Though not necessarily in that order. Join us for some wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey talk of stories new and old. Listen to Earth Station Who wherever you access your podcasts. We're a proud member of the ESO Network. We're all stories in the end. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.